took this picture a couple days ago <laughs> in the swamps of Florida. Uh, so um, <laughs> this individual right here is the author of this activity. You may know him as Jeff Petty, but we called him Gator Hunter Man on this excursion. So this was an airboat uh, that has a 450 horsepower <laughs> engine running a big fan that will push you anywhere you want to go. <coughs> and uh, what started off as a just a gator observing trip quickly turned into a gator hunting trip when this <laughs> fellow that was with us decided to uh, go ahead and use a crossbow to try and kill a gator. And uh, Fortunately, the driver, uh, when we arrived there, the driver was pretty pro uh, gator hunting. <laughs> and he, and he, so he was willing to let this guy uh, do it. Of course, it cost an extra $500, but, you know, it was well worth it. And uh, so uh, with that in, in mind, I was going to, they always at the AAO, they always have a bunch of audience kind of questions. So the question now is, what was the best part? Was it the conference center? the lectures, the food, or the alligator hunting. And, and this was a video, but I don't think it's going to work. We could try of, uh, of us coming up on a gator. And anyway, we saw about 40 gators from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. And, uh, and, and got a couple hours of sleep after. Yeah, that's not going to work. So anyway, with that in mind, there was no like alleged connection between hunting alligators and tort reform. It just happened to work out that way. But uh, so the AMA estimates that indirect and direct costs of malpractice are about 5 to 10 percent of total Medicare uh, medical medical costs and which comes to about 100 anywhere between 80 and 150 180 billion dollars. And that estimate is largely based on a study uh, by two Stanford uh, economists uh, McClellan and, and Kessler that took uh, states that had un that had uh, instituted tort reform, m mostly uh, caps on non-economic damages, and they compared them to states that hadn't uh, instituted any kind of tort reform, and then they looked at hospitalized patients for cardiac problems, specifically heart attacks, and they compared the cost of the of the uh, malpractice. Uh, uh, everything from the co the in increased cost of the patient to potential malpractice claims, and and they lumped all that together, and then they they made the assumption that those cardiac patients in those states uh, could uh, represent all hospitalized patients, in fact, all healthcare costs, and, and that's how they came up with that number. So it's kind of a, it, it, at the very least, it's a, a rough estimate. Um, uh, which wasn't a very well, you know, it's, it's hard to assume that those costs would carry over to other kinds of patients, especially outpatient settings. The other studies since then uh, by the uh, Congressional Budget Office and the, uh, the GAOs and other uh, appropriations kind of uh, study group that says that it's probably more like a half a percent or somewhere around 20 billion. And uh, what these studies basically did is they used the same format where they looked at pa uh, states that had instituted tort reform and states that hadn't. But in this uh, study, they included all kinds of hospitalized patients. So again, we're just looking at hospitalized patients and uh, compared the costs between the two. And, and that's how they came up with this number. So, you know, it, it's such a difficult, you know, number to come up with as, as far as how much of medical costs is related to malpractice. Um, but I guess the kind of questions I have for you is, th would it really matter? Does it, does it really matter what the, the, the cost of medical malpractice is in the, in the U.S. to say that we do need tort reform? A lot of people argue that that's why we, we need to do it. And I would submit that there's other reasons why we need to uh, uh, bring in some tort reform. So I thought I'd define a few things for you. Uh, and then give you uh, some data on the amount of medical malpractice. So I'm not talking about med medical malpractice costs, but true medical malpractice in the United States and how much uh, uh, data on some claims, states that have impl implemented tort reform, lessons learned from other subspecialties, and then and at the end I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some ophthalmology stats. And uh, if there's any 
uh, comments or questions as we go along, please just stop me and raise your hand, and I'm interested to see what your, what your uh, uh, viewpoints are and, and things you've learned as well. It's, it's a really big topic, and I, I don't have that many slides. So, Tort reform uh, can be defined as a civil common law claims that uh, provide a means for, for a harmed individu individual to be compensated. And reform is the idea that the current law needs changing, and many of the uh, uh, possibilities for tort reform come in the, in the idea of caps, where you, you limit the amount of non-economic -econo damages that an individual that's been harmed can, can be awarded. Uh, there's, uh, tort reform can come in, the, in limiting the amount of time that they have to bring a case uh, to the uh, justice system. Tort reform also can uh, be in the form of removing inefficiencies in the system. As of right now, it's, a, it's estimated that 50% of the money awarded to a uh, plaintiff actually goes to the plaintiff. The rest goes to the attorneys and, and other costs involved. Um, and, and there's many other uh, forms of, of tort reform that are proposed, and we'll talk about some of those. So the definition of medical malpractice this is Captain Dave, by the way. He's the gator hunter. If you've seen the movie Swamp or the, the show Swamp People, he's kind of your stereotypical. Um, anyway, he's great. So uh, professional uh, negligence is basically the definition of medical malpractice. If uh, you can be shown to be negligent in your uh, profession, then you can be found to, uh, you know, uh, guilty of medical malpractice. However, it's very difficult to prove negligence. Uh, you have to show that the duty was owed to the patient, the duty was breached, the breach caused an injury, and damages occurred. If any of these four criteria are not met, then you, you cannot be found guilty of uh, medical malpractice, at least in a perfect system. <laughs> yeah. So the duty was owed is basically that you uh, that the, the, the patient was owed a certain amount of, uh, I don't know how to, to word it, but that you owed a, a duty to the patient in that you, you were expected to provide uh, care for the patient, uh, you know, surgical expertise to the patient. There was some sort of duty that, uh, that they uh, could expect from you. There are, you know, instances where a patient might not be a formal patient in your practice. But, you know, they come up to you and ask you advice. You know, your neighbor asks you advice on a certain problem. And, and I think the minute that you assume the role of a physician to that person, you begin to have a duty to that person. So you, you need to keep that in mind when, you know, at any time that you're acting as a physician to another individual. Did that answer your question? Do you have any other insight to add to that? Many times attorneys will name multiple people in a lawsuit, anybody that's ever, you know, interacted with the patient. And, and so a lot of times uh, this will not be met because it, for those individuals that were kind of on the periphery. Dr. Mitch. Okay, this uh, a lot of this stemmed from me being named in a in a civil ca in a case, and uh, I, while I was being deposed, I was waiting for the plaintiff's attorney to show up, and I was sitting there speaking with the defense attorney. We were just chatting, and I brought up this idea of tort reform because it's something I've been interested in, and and they actually taught me a lot of this stuff. So I, I wanted to share this with you. I thought this was imp surprising to me. But there's also, yeah, 
it's good to know this data because people will, you know, defense or uh, plaintiff attorneys and stuff may quote this, but uh, just be aware of the limitations of these studies. The California, California Medical Insurance Feasibility Study was uh, brought about in the 70s because California was thinking of going to a no-fault insurance type of system. And that's basically an insurance type system where, as a physician, you don't carry malpractice insurance. Every individual carries, uh, kind of shares the burden of malpractice uh, uh, costs, and they pay into this pot. And then, uh, in, at least in New Zealand, they also have this. The, the government then pays out to individuals that have been harmed. So you bring your case to the government. A, a no fault is that there you can't find any. So anyway, California was thinking of doing this back in the 70s. And uh, so they did this study to say, okay, how many, uh, what's our potential outpay? You know, are we going to end up owing more than we, you know, as California, as the costs already are? And they found that 5% of hospitalized patients were somehow injured from their treatments. That's not to say that they, you know, that malpractice was involved, but that patients were injured, about 5%. So one in 20. And then... A s one in six of these injuries, you know, could be shown to be from medical malpractice. So about 0.8% of total hospitalized patients could potentially have a, a malpractice case, you know, uh, that they could bring. So that was surprising to California. So they abandoned their idea of uh, no-fault insurance, ass assuming that they would probably ha see this big jump in uh, malpractice cases. Uh, a, a later study from out of Harvard analyzed 31,000 hospital records in New York, and they were so. What happened is a group of nurses went through all these uh, hospital records, and they identified uh, patients that may have underwent some type of injury, and then those uh, those patients' records then went to two independent physicians, and the in the in the physicians then rated the injuries as to whether that you could clearly define that there was some sort of negligence, and they put them on a one to five scale, and then if both physicians ranked the uh, uh, ranked the case as a 3.5 or higher, so clear, you know, fairly high evidence of negligence, both of them had to agree on that. Then uh, and then it was said yes, these were likely negligent uh, cases. And they found that 4% of all hospitalized patients were, again, likely injured from their treatments. But a fourth of those, about 1% of total hospitalized patients, were likely uh, negligent. And uh, despite this, they went back and they studied all of these patients. About 14% of the cases that they found to be negligent actually did bring a malpractice claim. So uh, there is this misconception of everyone that has a, a clear-cut medical malpractice case brings a, a lawsuit and in reality it's about you know 14 percent at least in that study there's been a Utah and Colorado study that did similar methods to Harvard and again they found about one percent uh, the same uh, one percent of hospitalized patients could be shown to be victims of, of medical malpractice to me yeah Yes, they did, and it was like uh, two percent, two or three percent. So again, that this idea of frivolous lawsuits, there, are, there actually are very few frivolous, frivolous lawsuits. Most of them can be shown that there was an injury. So frivolous has this again, this definition that's very nebulous, and you know who knows what what constitutes a frivolous lawsuit. Just because a uh, lawsuit doesn't end up getting paid out, and we'll talk about the rates of of medical malpractice claims that actually get, uh, that have indemnity associated with them. Uh, there's very few that actually get paid out and, uh, and, and this idea of a, of a bunch of frivolous lawsuits is, is probably not true. Other questions? Okay. So, <laughs> this is us in Walmart trying on some camel before our gay gator hunt at night. <coughs> Texas, Florida, and Missouri have the ba best data as to the amount of malpractice claims uh, because these states require all the insurance companies to submit every claim to them, whether it's been you know, paid out or, or just closed without indemnity. And uh, they show that over the last 15 years, the amount of claims, the number of claims has actually remained steady. There isn't this climb in amount of medical malpractice claims when you control for population and economic growth. So there is an increasing amount of uh, malpractice claims, but it, when you control for other factors, it, it's not really changed. And the size of claims, however, has increased 
And uh, when you control for other factors, they feel like this is likely from the increasing cost of health care. So this is a really busy slide. Uh, this was a study that came out of the, um, this group here, uh, let's see, Milo and Kachalia in April, a medpack.gov kind of a study. And they went through and looked at all the, all the different um, uh, types of tort reform that have been uh, instituted throughout the different states. Um, and uh, without going through all of it, I'll just mention the, the main ones. Th there is a limit or cap uh, in, I, I think these are states, these jurisdictions, uh, 37 um, jurisdictions, and then they mention a few that are kind of a little different. Uh, all states have a statute of limitations. 28 states have placed uh, limitations on attorney's fees. <coughs> uh, there's some periodic payments that can be, you know, uh, awarded or, 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 you know, that kind of uh, injunction can be made on, on different uh, uh, defendants. Um, this, uh, let's see, the one that we're in here, uh, this alternative dispute resolution, arbitration, mediation settlement, and uh, 17 of them, including us, have, have uh, made this uh, requirement for a screening panel before trial. And, and some states have, have made it where if you go through this screening panel and the panel finds that the case is non-meritorious, if you decide to move forward as a plaintiff, then you are then uh, subject to the loser pays rules which they, uh, if the plaintiff then ends up losing the case, they then pay for the defendant's uh, attorney fees. And there's, there's data on that, um, whether that makes any difference. Uh, 22 states uh, have a requirement for some sort of certificate of merit, and, and so that's a similar kind of a thing where you have an outside party saying, yes, this case has merit, let's go ahead and uh, you're, you know, can move forward. <coughs> Texas has had uh, some interesting legislature. Um, they capped their non-economic damages at 250,000 in 2003, and then they just recently adopted this loser pays, uh, which you might see in the literature as English law. A long time ago, Britain made the same uh, kind of uh, law that, you know, in the, uh, if a plaintiff uh, loses, then they, they pay the, all the tort fees. Interestingly enough, in Texas, the average OBGYN malpractice premium was 131,000. After this uh, cap was instituted, it dropped by about half. They also, there has been studies that have showed that patients have better access to healthcare now with more subspecialists remaining in, uh, in uh, Texas. They've had increased number of physicians and they've like quadrupled the number of out-of-state physicians applying for a Texas uh, uh, medical license. So <laughs> A lot of people are, are happy, a lot of physicians are happy about the tort reform that's gone there. <coughs> the same study that I mentioned uh, earlier, this is their summary statement at the beginning. And I think it, it's kind of my take home here that although the evidence base for evaluating most traditional state tort reforms is substantial and mature. So there's, there's evidence out there. For most of the reforms, it does not identify a significant effect on the key outcome variables. So if you're talking about costs of health care, tort reform probably doesn't make a big dent, is what they're saying here. The exception was non-economic damages, and there was, there was two other policies that did uh, kind of make a, a dent, and I'll, I'll uh, mention those in a second. Um, the evidence base is small, and they haven't really been tested in the U.S. Analogous systems, such as in Europe, uh, are not clearly predictive of how they would function in the U.S., um, but based on theoretical predict predictions and the limited evidence, most of the reforms are promising enough to merit controlled experimentation in the U.S. Um, so there is, most everyone is of the idea, and it's, it's been interesting to see the politics on either side of the aisle, you know, say start to come forward with a uh, tort reform. As a as a feasible you know option, and there seems to be a lot of voter support. So I think we're going to continue to see uh, these kind of reforms being placed in each state. Caps seem to make a difference. Uh, Pre-trial screenings, such as what we have here, seem 
seems to make a small difference in the cost of health care. And enterprise insurance, which is this idea of taking the physician out of the, out of kind of out of the hot seat, if you will, and instead of myself carrying individual malpractice insurance, a hospital or some sort of a large group would carry the malpractice insurance, and uh, and then they would, you know, provide all of the, the medical or the uh, the attorneys services and and defend you, much like the VA has. Or, or large universities like we are here. So a similar kind of setup that we have here at the university or at the VA would then be adopted by, by everyone in the, in the US. The, the big kickback, the people that don't like this actually are the private physicians because they're worried that they're gonna then lose control of the way they practice medicine. If you have some large body that's, con that's controlling your malpractice insurance and they can then dictate the way you practice medicine saying, well, the, what you're doing is dangerous and you know, we're not gonna have you do that. Or we, don't, we don't cover that type of practice so you cannot do that type of procedure, or et cetera. So, um, anesthesia, uh, back in 1999, they uh, found that, they did an analysis of all their medical, medical malpractice claims and found that one third of them were due to these adverse respiratory events and they identified preventable measures that they could implement uh, to change those adverse respiratory e events, and they worked to develop them. And since then, their premiums have dropped you know, m by more than half, and the rates of adverse events are much improved, and they've received accolades from different safety boards that have showed that anesthesia is now one of the safest uh, medical practices out there. And and so there is a way we can take control as physicians to lower medical mal malpractice insurance costs by limiting the things that we do that have been shown to be uh, harmful to patients. And I think we've done a lot of that. You, you know, that, that you, know, you mark the, the uh, above the eye that you're gonna be operating on. That's as a direct result from uh, you know, uh, lawsuits. And so the argument that uh, pro-medical uh, malpractice uh, individuals make to physicians is that medical malpractice has actually improved the way we practice medicine. And it's made things safer for patients, and you'll read a lot of arguments uh, about that. And, I, you know, are they valid? Pro you know, in my opinion, y in some cases, yeah. It is, a, it is a method by which we're motivated to change the way we practice. And the last couple slides here, ophthalmology, uh, this is more of a you know, omics trying to uh, sell you to sell you their their policies, but uh, I think it's kind of uh, it's just educational as to you know, on average, about seventy to maybe eighty percent of claims are closed without any kind of payment, and uh, the average uh, uh, payment in ophthalmology this is ophthalmology specific, the average payment in ophthalmology is somewhere you know among those numbers, so. As practices go, we're actually low on the malpractice payout amount, and the and and so we have a, a pretty good, you know, track record. But I'm sure we could improve. So, the main the main discussion I'd like to hear is, uh, do you feel like there are benefits from having uh, tort reform to to patients? Like, would it help patients to have tort reform, or would it would it make it harder for them to bring? meritorious cases, you know, to the, the justice system and be, you know, compensated for the injury that they've, I don't know. I, th I think both sides have an argument and it's probably somewhere in the middle. Any comments or, I think that's all I had. Uh, this was, this is actually an interesting uh, website. It's uh, a bunch of attorneys talking about tort reform. <laughs> so you get to see, see there, and I really like this, this quote, and it's a long one, but I'll, I'll just run, run through it real quick. Uh, there's at least the perception that litigation is too easily brought and very expensive to defend. So she's a, is a <laughs> I love these attorneys, like, well, at least there's this perception. It's not true, but there's people out there that think this. <laughs> there's also a perception that those of us who are lawyers have a vested interest in the system and are unwilling to look at the flaws of that system, right? I mean, they make a lot of money off medical malpractice. So sh she actually started this whole uh, website here. So, and this was, 
you know, 100 people had commented and made all these arguments. And so she comes back and she says, I return to my original question with a twist. What are we trying to accomplish with our American civil justice system? Do we want a system that provides a just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every dispute? You know, that comes right out of, of civil procedure and something that they, you know, when tort law was originally designed, that's what they wanted to achieve. Do we want a system that permits people to resolve differences in court? If so, do we have that kind of a system? She suggests not, and maybe what we should just try to do is define the problem. Is it too much litigation, or is it the problem, the cost? You know, I think those are valid points, and I think that's where we need to work at, is, is changing the system and, uh, and making it work for the patients that actually were injured. You know, that's what, that's what we're trying to prevent. You know, as, as, as physicians, we make mistakes, it's, you know, it's part of the job where to err is human, right? That came out, uh, you know, what, 10 years ago and, and it's been put into law. And the, uh, <coughs> the fact of the matter is people are injured by medicine and it's not a perfect system. And helping people understand that it's not perfect is, uh, is I think, part of the solution to this as well. I think that's all I had, yeah. I had another video of hunting a gator, but I don't think it's going to work, so try it. Yeah, I don't think it's going to pull up. It's a different format. It came from my phone. Anyway, questions or uh, comments? Yeah. So we went through this. Uh, so this is kind of that s a summary slide. I don't know if you saw this one. Um, it's just what's been done throughout the U.S. So the, as far as decreasing costs, these were the three that actually seemed to make a difference in costs. Now, whether other reforms may have a better impact on the patient being able to come forward with the claim or, or, or – yeah, that's – yeah, a no, like a no-fault insurance system. They did look at that, and it, they found that actually that would probably increase the overall cost of health care. But, you know, it, it certainly has its advantages, um, uh, but there's a lot of disadvantages. Dr. Bennett? Yeah, right. So I didn't dive into that, but that's a huge topic right now. And uh, so first off, defensive medicine is really difficult to put a number on. Because you, th so they did a study in Pennsylvania. They surveyed all the doctors in Pennsylvania. And they, they asked them, how many of you have changed the way you practice medicine because of the, your concern for litigation? 94% said, yes, I have changed the way I practice because of the fear of litigation. 94%. So that, that study was widely publicized as to, oh, defensive medicine is causing this huge, you know, increase in the cost of health care. And then when, they, when it came down to it, uh, they did more in-depth studies other than just a survey asking that simple question. And they found that the cost of defensive medicine is actually probably quite low, and it doesn't play a big role in the way we practice medicine, that the much larger ways we, play, we practice medicine are, are influenced by who we're around and where we trained. And so that there's, there's data on both sides, but a hard number has been really difficult to come up with. Uh, and it, maybe you could ask, maybe we could do a, you know, a survey in here is how many of you have changed the way you practice medicine because of the fear for liability? You know? And then how, what, what percent of your practice is probably, you know, are you ordering a bunch of tests that, you know, or just a few, or, you know, is it, are they expenses or practices that you probably would have done anyway, but you, you were more likely to do? So, you know, you can see all these different arguments that people are, are making. The, the main test that has been ordered because of the fear of liability is imaging. And that, you know, CT scans and MRIs have really jumped because of this fear of liability. And when you take the total cost of those tests and compare them to all the other costs of healthcare, it, it came out quite low. Dr. McCabe. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Did you have a mic? Yeah, right. Yeah, actually, so arbitration was lumped in that pre-trial screenings. Uh, it w all those kind of pre-trial arbitration, uh, there's a couple other terms they used. Uh, they all were found to be helpful. Um, arbitration mediation, settlement conferences, this, uh, and then this, um, uh, what do they call this? Uh, medical, let's see, this, uh, this pre-screening pre-screening panel, yeah, they lumped that in, yeah. So those are those are as Dr. Mifflin was mentioning, those have been helpful. Dr. Hatch. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And that's what that last uh, quote was kind of discussing is, you know, large or small in court, do we want, it's just, it's, it's a lot of patients are falling through the cracks, yeah. The ones that probably deserve some compensation, especially for just healthcare costs, you know. Things that they had to pay for that they wouldn't have had, you know, we not made an error in the first place. Yeah, at least here, 